Hello, and welcome to Soul's Project Management Times, the podcast which looks at the ins and outs of the project management world. Disclaimer, all opinions in this podcast are those of the individuals involved and not of any company they work for or are affiliated with. So, let's get on with the show. Today, I'm talking to Benedict Pinches. Hi, Ben. Hi, Sol. How are you? Good. To start us off, could you just tell us how you got into project management? Yeah, um, I certainly can. So I've been involved in uh, programs and projects really since the 1990s. Um, I first got involved, I was doing some temping work. Uh, One of these particular jobs took me into a government agency that was just embarking on a large accountancy program, moving from cash accounting to resource accounting which was quite a big step for that particular agency. And I was with a team of contractors and we were told that we needed to run what we were doing as a programme. And at that point, nobody had really heard what, a, nobody really knew what a programme was. So I was given the job of putting the programme office together. So I, I was just given a load of books and told to get on with it, really. So that was what sparked my interest initially. There was very little out there. It was very... It was a very new and I thoroughly enjoyed sort of designing and putting together this program office and then having it support the nature of the work that the contractors were doing and, and managing all the resource and doing all of that. Yeah, really. So in the 90s, was because when was the APM formed? So the APM started, I think, a bit earlier than the 90s. I think it was the uh, late 70s, early 80s. But the Book of Knowledge came about in, in the 1990s. So uh, you did quite a few years in the Highways Agency. And then what sort of things did you move on to after that? So after that, I went from uh, a government agency to a startup, um, mm-hmm. which was a, uh, a telco startup at the turn of the century. So it was the, the, the kind of boom time, if you like, for, for telco. So there was a lot of them dotted around. And it was in the time when there was this big drive towards this wonderful thing that we knew as, as 3G, which nobody had at that point. So mm-hmm. it was terribly exciting. The, the company that I worked for was a company called 186K, uh, which was entirely funded by Lattice, the gas transmission company. And it was a, a, a fantastic experience seeing a completely new company uh, start from scratch. Um, so it started with a handful of contractors and quickly grew to, to about 250 full-time people. And the program office for that, and it was a completely program-led organisation. So it was it was very different from the highways agency, and it was starting, you know, from from ground zero, and everything was related to programs, which was really exciting for someone like me, basically. <laughs> And then I moved across to central office of Lattice when it merged with National Grid in 2002. And again, a change of direction and a very interesting situation because you don't often get an opportunity to manage a merger like of two such huge companies. And there were a number of associated difficulties with that. So what was the biggest difficulty there then? From a sort of project management point of view was that obviously when you get two large entities like that merging, you, you're not allowed to divulge the actual merger date. Ah. Um, so I was working with contractors to put in desks for traders and various construction uh, subcontractors. I wasn't allowed to convert the finish time that they needed to have everything done by because that would have given away the date of the actual merger. Oh, so unlike traditional project management where you're driving against a particular milestone date, I was driving against a date that I knew the people who were working alongside me didn't know and weren't allowed to know. So that was quite a, that was quite a challenge, uh, an interesting sort of curveball really. So did you give them sort of your own dates that are a bit earlier or how did you manage that? Uh, I gave them, they knew that, so they were sort of fake dates, um, mm-hmm. you know, that, and, and you're not, you know, you're not going to get people working to, to their to their best if they know that the date is actually, so it, yeah, it was, it was curious. It, everything happened, everything was, was went, went well um, <laughs> in the end, but uh, it, there was a few tense moments. Cool. So after that, uh, I see on your LinkedIn, as I've got that open in front of me, um, the Commission for Energy Regulation was your next venture yeah so there was there was quite a long stint at, at national grid actually before then because i i moved obviously uh, following the merger there was a lot of consolidation work to do and 
a lot of that on the property side well to me to do because I, I guess I'd proved myself at the corporate centre uh, in London. So I did a lot of property consolidation where there were duplicate offices and did the consolidation into the Midlands headquarters building um, just in Warwick. And then after that, decided that I needed a break. Um, I've done a lot of quite big property uh, jobs and um, I took up a contract in, in Ireland uh, which was very different again. Um, it was part of the Good Friday Agreement. It was a single electricity market, so bringing together the two markets, uh, Northern Ireland and uh, Southern Ireland, and putting them into one market. This was challenging. There, I mean, there were various technical challenges, but obviously the main challenges were legal and political mm. because there were an awful lot of parliament things that needed to be signed on both sides and needed to be sequenced on both sides uh, and there was a lot of uh, cross-working so I had a split program office in Belfast and in Dublin and moved between the two and you know obviously there are differences in the way people approach things in the north and the south. I know obviously there's lots of political tensions between the two so culturally would you say it, it was different working in the two halves of Ireland? Yes, I think so. I think think it is culturally different. I mean, there are, there are similarities, but there are, yeah, there are there, there are different ways of working. In the same way, I guess that if you're in if you're working in Europe and and, and you're working on the um, on on the border between France and Spain, you know, there are differences in the way that French and Spanish would work, even though there's only a few miles. Culturally, it was it was it was very interesting um, and I, I learned a lot about stakeholder engagement one of the main focal points that kept the program going uh, this stakeholder forum that we had on a monthly basis where all the various parties the various energy companies regulators um, individuals uh, sometimes politicians uh, lawyers etc would all come and there would be updates from various parts of the program and there would be question and answer sessions and at times it would get quite tense and heated and, and at other times a lot of information to take on board um, and a lot of uh, sequencing to sort out. So that taught me, um, I guess, the importance of keeping everybody involved on, on the same page and, and, and in the picture and making sure that nobody felt they were getting sort of second-hand information. Right, so after Ireland... Um... You came back to the UK after that? Yeah, so after um, I had uh, quite a young family, so I was quite keen to come back, having spent uh, 18 months or so away. And I started looking for my next contract and was contacted actually by somebody I worked with saying, would I consider going back to National Grid but working in the technology area rather than in property? which was uh, quite an interesting proposition, although I felt a bit daunted. You know, that's not my background, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that I was an expert in. But I did know a lot of the people there. I did know the way that people approach things. And because the team were really very good business analysts and knew what they were doing, the technical side of, of the technology work was, was not such an issue because that was covered off very ably by my team. Uh, and I was more involved in making sure that the performance of the team was, was going well, that we were linking in properly to governance within the technology area, and that the business cases were being produced at the right time to be presented through the sequence of various approvals that were required to, to, to get the, the project kicked off. The various projects, sorry, not, not projects single, single. There, were, there was a, a multitude of, of, of quite small IT projects. Um, that all needed to be uh, accelerated rather than uh, drawn out in a long uh, bureaucratic process. So I did that for quite a, quite a bit of time. And then there was uh, a transformation of the technology area. Uh, and there, were, there was an outsourcing to six different partners, which was obviously quite a large business transformation work. And because of my experience with the BAs, I was asked to lead the design of the business relationship management function. Uh, which was a totally new function. So they hadn't had that kind of innovative technology and the various businesses in National Grid. Um, and we were taking on some of the BAs that I had managed, but also taking people from outside and interviewing people, putting people through training, designing what the structure was going to look like, the business were brought into it, then implementing it really, which was a very interesting and engaging piece of work. And then finally at National Grid, I would I've led a team that put together the revised investment to initiation process, the key process within technology for getting 
projects approved. And because of my experience in getting the business cases approved, I kind of knew where the issues were. And it was very much a piece of lean work, really, in stripping down the process and getting it as rapid as, as possible um, so that these projects could actually um, get accelerated onto the new design with the new suppliers. Uh, and at that point, I was studying at the same time, doing my master's at Oxford University and work and study and family life all, all going uh, at the same time. But it was a fantastic degree course and I got a huge amount out of it. I met some brilliant people who I then started a business with in 2011. So before you move on there, what would be your top tip for someone who's trying to juggle sort of career, family and maybe even education as well? I think my top tip is you need to accept that you're not going to be able to give 100% to any of them. I like that. And I think that's quite a battle uh, because if you're anything like me, you know, you want you know to give it your best at work and you want to give it your best at study and you want to give it your best as a family man. But you simply can't do that. If you do, then then at least one of the other th- one of the other two areas is going to suffer. Yes. So you need to, to ratchet it back really and just say, well, I can only only give seventy percent. So this essay that I'm handing in is not the best to do, but it's it, it's a, a good stab and it's a good attempt and it's all like the time that I can afford to spend on it. Um, yes. I think that was something that's taken me years to work out, and I, I've been yeah. working alongside studying for eight years now. And it was only a couple of years ago that I thought, actually, I don't need to not sleep and I can choose which thing you can put less energy into, whether it is your family or whether it is not getting, trying to get a first in your exams. Um, so we were on to your company uh, that you started up with your fellow students. Yes. So we had an idea sort of over coffee, as you do when you're studying intensely with the same people uh, over a two-year period. Um and the idea that we had was that for large programs or mega projects, there didn't seem to be very much on the market uh, by way of tools and support uh, for the softer of program management. So there were there are lots of tools available for uh, risk management, finance management. You know, there's um, Primavera and things for charts and and time management and scheduling and things. But in terms of the mood, if you like, of the project team, the engagement of the stakeholders, the competencies of, of various people perhaps on the project board, you know, there didn't seem to be a lot out there. So we had an idea to build some tools, to build a platform, technology platform from which we could build some tools. And we set out to raise the money to, to get the... Uh, to get the design built. I was um, and am managing director for the company and it fell to me to go out to a lot of these angel um, fairs and the uh, the venture capitalist um, meetings and things and I'd have to do the five minute soapbox stuff and the pitches and the sort of um, sales bits and hadn't really done that before so it was a very interesting um, interesting learning curve for me. I suppose that's not something that many project managers do. You usually get dropped in once the bid's been done. Yeah, I think think you're right. To begin with, it felt slightly unnatural. Mm -hmm. But actually, I soon realised that there is quite an overlap because very often in my career up to that point, I had been talking to people and summarising large amounts of complicated information or to give them a sort of a state of the project or to give them an overview of the business case or whatever. So actually those things aren't a million miles apart. Although it never felt like sales to me uh, when I was doing that that summary work, in fact it is quite similar to sales. If you want a business case to go through and you're summarised to explain to the head of architecture why it should go through, you inevitably are put, putting a a sales spin on it uh, because you want the work to go through and you want your your team to you know to, to, to continue working on and doing the stuff that they've, they've been doing. I suppose what I've discovered recently is that sales doesn't seem to be it's not a magic art as such it's just sort of just being excited about it and sort of explaining how good it is and personally I do that about the projects I work on it's just I'm not necessarily I'm set up and I have to sell ideas to people a lot in my role as a project manager you know sort of the engineering guys making sure that I sell them the ideas of let's start this new process or let's do it this way um it's all just people skills really 
That's absolutely right, Sol. And the other thing that I realised while I was doing it is that it's quite a challenge to explain programme management to people who only have five minutes uh, and are looking for the next big thing. If people haven't been involved in it at all, then you kind of need more than five minutes, I found. And often the attractions of more tangible offerings from other um, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, such as you know, lockable dog bowls or automatic, you know, screens that, that, that pop up or whatever that were much easier to understand uh, <laughs> what it was than, than our system, which to me was quite straightforward. But when I started talking about it, I could see people's eyes glazing over and realise that, you know, they'd almost immediately written it off. So consequently, we, we were unable to um, that way. But uh, it actually was for the best, really, um, and often these things these things happen because it, we were continually iterating the design anyway and working with, by this time we were working with a, um, a, a very able, and we were continually cutting down, cutting down and, and, and bringing the offering you know, back to what was absolutely critical. And we had an opportunity at Unilever having some problems with uh, a project uh, which was a global project with a lot of attention being paid to it, a very aggressive um, timeline and there was a lot of stress I think across the team and a way of making sure that they knew you know, that this globally spread team were actually okay and that they felt all right about the work they were doing and our idea fell absolutely squarely into that. Um, so I did a, a pitch to a group of people from Unilever who were very receptive and they said, well, that sounds interesting. You know, I'd really like to see it. Uh, and I had to say, well, there's nothing to see. So you're still, um, what's the company called? Your Oxford Major Programmes? Yes. So so you're still... Yes, so um, still doing platform, still building it, and uh, we have a small number of customers, and I'm looking to expand and to grow the team. The, the original team that I worked with are all fully engaged now on Oxford Major Programme jobs, which is great for them, but not so great for, for me, because uh, I need some, some more help, basically. So uh, we're looking at you know the next steps, which is the scaling thing, which entrepreneurs often have to face and, and quite how we're going to do that and you know where we're going to get the money these kind of things uh start start coming coming to the fore in the meantime as i say i've been doing uh bits and pieces of work so i've, I've had some um uh, interesting engagements uh with uh oxford university press and uh southwest water tax authority, uh, all kinds of interesting clients and different sorts of pieces of work ranging from a couple of days to sort of ongoing part-time contract work. Cool. So I also wanted to touch on, um, you're quite active with the Association for Project Managers. I wondered if you could give me an overview of sort of what opportunities you found with them to volunteer. Um, yes, so I have been uh, a member of APM um, since about 2001, although initially I didn't really do anything other than just pay the membership and I was certainly not an active member, I didn't go to any events or anything. I think I started going to events five years after that uh, and um, when I moved back to UK from Ireland I uh, I joined the Thames Valley chapter which was part of the, well sorry, the Thames Valley branch uh, divided into chapters at that point. So I joined the Oxford chapter and started working and helping out organising events. And I've had quite a varied amount of, you know, varied opportunities uh, at APM over the last 10 years or so, ranging from helping to put the rules together for the PM challenge that Thames Valley does. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how are the entries marked or what? You know what kind of weight is given to different responses, etc. So the PM challenge is a competition for is it it's just people at the beginning of their careers and that's, students, that's, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, the companies um, involved put forward their often new recruits into the into the company. So often they're university leavers, mm -hmm. um, and it's a really good way of getting people to manage their first actually think about. Um, the different aspects of it and also do that in a competitive environment against other <laughs> other companies in a similar position so it's you know it's really uh, there's a lot of learning I think all around uh, uh, in that and I think it, it, it's a really good uh, really good thing and it's been growing every year since um, uh, since since we started doing it 
Yes, it's, I think the thing I learned most from it was I, my team, we did it in 2014, in our first year of our apprenticeship. And it was the fact that we'd all done sort of projects at school and, I don't know, at scout camp. But this was doing a project at work and it still had that, as, some, as, as, as most of us were quite young, it was, it was the people side of it and it was the fact that you're working with these people and there just needed to be that slightly higher level of professionalism. We couldn't deal with it like a university assignment where you always get one person slacking off and one person who does all the work because it was a and our deliverable was for our workplace we all had to sort of pitch in and it was part of our job so it was sort of it was quite a different dynamic from what we'd been used to yeah that's interesting yeah you did really well in yours didn't you I remember yeah, I think we won, won our one so mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we nearly fell out with each other but it all went well in the end um <laughs> <laughs> But it was it's that old um, storming, forming, norming yes, uh, thing. Yeah. We definitely went through that whole process. And hopefully, I think we were performing by the end. And it's over nine months or so, the whole competition. So it was quite a long time for us to get to know each other. And it was, yeah, it was a really good experience. So uh, another area of APM that I've become very involved in is the research advisory group. So for some time now, I have really wanted a to play a bigger role in the development uh, and support of research in the project management area. So I've really pushed for more money to be put aside for new and that's really grown quite substantially over the last sort of three or four years. Um, uh, there's been really good uh, help from Ibis House. We've now got considerably more to spend on on research than we did have at the beginning and the quality of the the applications has really gone up as well which is which is great and initiatives like the the summarization of pieces of research into a couple of sides of a4 for for busy practitioners Mm -hmm. um that's now really up and up up and running and there's there's quite a few that that daniel nichols has actually uh commissioned and put together now which i think is really a useful additional set of tools for project and program managers. So that's something that else that I'm involved in as well. And I think there are all sorts of opportunities moving forward with APM that are, that are outside of the traditional branch and, and SIG structure. Um, I think it's up to people really to be inventive and to think about what they would like to do uh, and to actually put that forward to APM and you know seek support and, and, and help to, to drive it forward. So what sort of people apply to do research? Is it just sort of postgraduate students or is there a mix of people? There is a very good mix of people actually. Um, you get uh, more postgraduate students now uh, that there is some funding available and some support available so there are more uh, sort of you know proper academic submissions but you you also get some really interesting stuff being proposed from volunteers and from people in branches and SIGs that, that you know want to actually study a particular area I mean they may not have the academic background to do that but they uh, they are able to articulate what they want to do and and quite often it's uh, a case of matching them up maybe with some, some other people who can help them or supporting them in a slight way. Um, so we try and, 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 keep, it, uh, and keep, it, keep it broad. That's really cool. So lastly, you're also a member of the Volunteer Steering Group. Could you sort mm. of tell me what that's about? So the Volunteer Steering Group came about as a result of a a sort of change in uh, volunteer governance structure. Um, So before they had um, a branch steering group and a SIG steering group, these two bodies would meet uh, independently and together and discuss and agree things like the volunteers' forums and publication of new material and all kinds of things. And there was a number of issues with that kind of structure, quite sort of cumbersome and slow moving and difficult to be the that wonderful catchphrase agile hmm. um so the proposal put forward was to actually have a volunteer steering group which was much s- smaller but represented 
uh, the branches and the and the SIGs. And this group, uh, because it was a more modest size, there's only sort of six of us, I think, at the moment. And because the CEO uh, attends the meetings, the idea was that this would be, uh, we'd be able to get more done and it would be a sort of faster, faster process, which I think is, I think is true. And there have been some very effective changes, albeit they haven't been, I think, that noticeable uh, to a lot of people in the volunteer community, but uh, they've been things that have made a lot more sense. For instance, the volunteers' forums are now sequenced much better to fit in with the business planning cycle, Mm -hmm. so we changed the dates for those. We were able to give back budget money that had been awarded to branches and SIGs because we knew through monitoring that they were not actually going to be rather than just have it at your end sitting there and unspent um, we were able to flag it early enough to give it back to Ibis House which enabled another number of other initiatives to kick off um, and for um, uh, other things to happen Um, so you know trying to make better use of uh, the uh, the money that the members all all pay that we all pay Mm-hmm. Uh, and just making sure that you know that, that that we can actually be much more proactive, and 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 respond to opportunities in 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 a better way. It's making the most of all the volunteers who volunteer for the APM. That's right. Yeah, and at the moment we are trying to help with the 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 measurement of impact for for all the wonderful volunteering activities that happen that everybody puts their their time and effort into. So having some kind of measurement of what the impact of all these activities is, I think will will be really helpful for people and will also allow people to see new things that they could get involved in that maybe they hadn't seen before. Wonderful. Right, I think that's all we've got time for. So now let's move on to our next section. Um, we're going to look at the stakeholder and communications management um, competency that is one of the compulsory competencies for applying to become chartered. So my plan for this is I'll sort of read them out and we can sort of chat around what it looks like in real life. So, uh, sorry, I'm just lifting my laptop over so I can read them. Um So stakeholder and communications management, there are one, two, three, four, six, seven parts to it, but you only need to actually demonstrate four of them. So the first one is determine stakeholder interests, requirements and levels of influence in a project. So there's quite a lot in this one. There's the influence and the requirements and also their interests. So I suppose one point to ask is what is the difference between interests and requirements of stakeholders? Um, that's a good question, Sol, and you're right that there is an awful lot to cover on this one, one point. Um, I think the requirements is what they actually need to know about the project. You know, what, what are they required to know? Uh, and the interests may be things that are, that are more distantly related to, to the project. So the interest is almost a more of a personalised offering for them. Um, so I suppose one of the hardest bits of project management is working out the requirements because people come to you saying they want a thing. Um, so say they come to you and say, I want a warship, but when you get down to it, actually what they want to do is to be able to shoot someone across the water, and they could do that with a little boat and a gun. Yes, and, and the reason it's such a big topic, this one bullet point, is because those requirements will change for the individual as well. I think as time moves on and people people's job, people's day jobs change, then their project will also change. Um, and that's... Um, you know, it's it's a moving it's a moving piece the whole time. Yes. Um, so somebody who's very influential at the beginning of the project may, by the by the middle of the project, not be very influential at all. Um, you know, they may have had and 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 actually not really uh, need to be listened to to quite the same degree that they did at the beginning. Um, and it's keeping track of all of those relationships and all of those different individuals that that I think is such a challenge and they're possibly different viewpoints their different interests and their different requirements of the project which I suppose is slightly different than the actual project requirements it's the people requirements you've also got um, what they require you to report to them and things like that 
Yes, and what they think they require may not be what they actually require as well. Um, so there is a degree of sifting through that and making sure that you're not running yourself ragged and producing a lot of stuff for people just because they're clicking their fingers and saying they they, they want it. Mm-hmm. So it's you know what is enough, what is what is reasonable, uh, what is necessary. You know all of these kind of questions that you need you, you need to ask yourself and, and you need to ask the stakeholders as well. And what will go into that decision is the last bit of this point is the influence. So someone may be shouting loudly, but actually they don't have that much influence on the project. So how much you listen to them will change depending on that. That's right. But again, that level of influence will change. Uh, The bigger the project, the longer the project, the more changes you're going to have throughout it. So even the main funder or the head of the the sponsoring organisation, their influence will be different at different points in the project. So, you know, that's, that's something... I think all too often when we do stakeholder engagement, we're very diligent at the beginning and we do a, a really big map and everybody's level of influence is decided on. But that isn't then looked at, you know, six months down the line or a year down the line. Um, and that's where the problems can come. So that brings us on to the second point, which is um, produce a stakeholder stakeholder management and communication plans. So what you're saying here is that you not only do you need to produce them, you also need to regularly update them? That's why you, you have to regularly update them. I mean, there's no point in, in, in producing, you know, there's no point in producing communications if those communications are no longer effective. And there's all kinds of things that could have happened uh, since, you know, since you actually devised the plan initially. People uh, often change jobs, uh, you know, with, within a project as well, and they'll take on different roles and all of those things you, know, you need to kind of take into account so that you're not sending out emails that, that people might find irritating because, you know, well, that's not even my area anymore. Why am I still getting this information? I don't need it anymore, kind of stuff. Um, so there's there's also the other side of that where, um, say, you move on and someone else is coming into your job. It's good to have those plans in place um, so that they know what you were doing and they don't have to sort of reinvent the wheel. Absolutely, yeah, and 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 also providing some kind of catch-up um, ability for people who are coming into a new job, you know, and uh, for whom your stakeholder updates may not make a lot of sense. I've just realised that before I started this, I probably should have got a sort of dictionary definition of what a stakeholder is. Um, do you have a sort of shortish description of what you would say a stakeholder is? I do have a shortish, uh, which is slightly different from the APMs, which is a bit longer. But my Ed Freeman, who was the kind of father of stakeholder uh, theory uh, back in the 70s and 80s. So for me, a stakeholder is anyone who is affected by the project's vision and outcomes. So it's any person or group of people who is affected by the program or project's vision and outcomes. And I suppose that's two way that they may affect the project or program, and they may be affected by it as well. It's it's or both. Correct. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, um, one that I'm not fully sure how to answer is um, showing that you can monitor the effectiveness of stakeholder management and communication plans. Have you got any sort of pointers on how you could do that? Well, yes, I have, uh, and it's difficult to avoid this turning into a bit of a sales pitch. But that's <laughs> what <laughs> that's what um, programs really is looking at. Um, um, ironically, uh, um, you completely uh, cut out, so we can't. I couldn't hear what you were. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the 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 obvious uh, the obvious way of doing this is via surveys. But I think people get fed up with surveys coming out and with responding to surveys. It may be an option to think about some kind of mobile tool or app that can track how people are feeling about the information that they're getting, their perception of the project is, uh, what they think about the way that they're being kept informed. So you can set these things up fairly simple and, and, and track them, I think, quite effectively through people's smartphones. And I suppose the very, very simple way is just to ask people and ask if they feel like they're being included and informed and communicated with. Absolutely, yeah. And depending on the size of your project, the best way of doing it, as you say, would be actually face-to-face. But 
the larger the project gets and the more global it gets, the more difficult it is then to be able to do that. Because I think it's one of those things, and it's the big, big thing with project management, I think, is that you need to tailor it to the project. So if you're on a small project with only 20 or so stakeholders, just talk to them, don't sort of do a big survey. But as soon as you're onto any anything near a mega project, it's worth maybe thinking about surveys or something bigger. That's right. I, yeah, that's right. I think you have to look at each individual project um, on its own. And I think a different combination of surveys is going to be required for different things. And that actually nicely leads us on to the next point, which is adjust stakeholder management and communication plans to respond to any changing needs of the project. Um, so your project may sort of change size towards the end. It may tail off or it may sort of grow so quite often projects are quite small at the beginning and then grow really quickly as you come into the implementation phase. I suppose that's the sort of big stage where things can get difficult with stakeholder communications is as the project starts to grow, making sure things are being scaled. Yeah, and I think um, that point really is an acknowledgement that like many of the processes in project management, these things are actually iterative and they're actually you know circular. So you don't just deliver something A to B. It's not an A to B process. Going back over um, what you've done before, reviewing it and seeing is it appropriate, how has the project changed? In the same way that you would with risk management, the same way that you would with lessons learned, you know, a lot of the processes that we follow are actually circular processes rather than linear. Um, And I think that's becoming much more well understood, you know, as we as we move through the 21st century. I think that was I was quite surprised by that with project management because when you first learn about a project, a unique transient ende- endeavor where it's a one-off and the idea of a one-off project being sort of circular is sort of feels wrong, but actually within that project you do need to do that that continual lessons learned, that continual learning from what you're doing. That's right. And it's the same, you know, I mean, benefits realisation is is a real case in point as well, which goes on after the project finishes. And you're continually looking and checking back on whether the benefits were delivered or not. You know, there's no point in just finishing the project saying we're not going to look at the benefits because we've done the project. You know, you've got to keep going over that and there's some iteration that's still going to continue. So I'd like to see a lot more sort of circular processes and a lot, a lot more acknowledgement that the way that we all work is actually an initiative way. Cool. Um, So the next uh, point is a very black and white one, really. Disseminate clear, timely and relevant information to stakeholders. So timely, I think is quite, um, although it's quite obvious, you've got to find out what timely is, because I've done projects where I've done monthly reports, weekly reports, bi-weekly reports. Um, So I suppose it's finding out all of this, the clear and the relevant one, is you've got to make sure that information is the right information for that stakeholder. And I think the timely bit is becoming more and more important as people get more and more used to real-time information. So when I started in program management, you know, acceptable lag and people would, you know, accept that it would take a, a day to, to, to get information and that therefore you might be reporting something that's a day out of date. Mm-hmm. You know, that simply isn't good enough these days with modern technology people expect when you're reporting that you're reporting pretty much to the minute so when you're going into a project board meeting and you're saying something is red or something is is green you know you should really be representing that situation at absolutely at that time rather than you know something that happened yesterday that's quite interesting because in my industry i'm used to when i was in sort of project controls making reports uh the reports i'd make the report um, there was a monthly cycle I'd make the report in week two week three it would go to the lower level project managers week four it would go to mid-level and then uh, week five or week one of the next month it would go up to upper management and so by the time it gets to the end of the cycle this information is three weeks old so it's quite interesting to hear you say mm-hmm. in the next day we obviously work in quite different industries and I suppose when, if as soon as you're getting anywhere that's more agile, surely they're having they'll use things like dashboards that are just kept up to date as you go. Um, yeah, you see, uh, that that's why. I mean, and, and that's where I think things are moving to because um, the difficulty is that you're ending up presenting says out of date, but then often you know, there, there, there are the various gains that are attached to that, which you know you, 
So you're presenting something that's it's marked red, but you're saying, well, actually, that's already been dealt with and it's not red anymore. <laughs> yep. So then the questions start getting asked, well, why are we actually sitting here getting this presentation then? You've had three weeks to, to sort it out. And, you know, so it's I think there is continuing pressure um, to shorten those the, the, those timelines. Um, and that timely bit, I think, is, is an interesting is an interesting point. Yes. Um, so clear and relevant information. So I suppose this is sort of around tailoring your data to different stakeholders. It's also, uh, I think, project management, like lots of different areas of business, you know, everybody loves their acronyms, you know, and people like to fall into the sort of techno babble of what it is that they're doing. And actually, you know, good stakeholder engagement isn't about that. It's about putting things in plain English. And sometimes it's easier for project managers to, to, to write in project management speak, which other people in the business just may not understand. Yes. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and as I said, that's not, that's not specific to project managers. It's, it, I've seen, uh, you know, a similar thing in, in, you know, obviously in technology and, uh, and certainly in property. There's a, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's a load of jargon and, and in legal uh, legal uh, in legal fields as well they have a lot of uh, particular words and phrases that they use but you know we need to be much more mindful as that not everybody works in projects and programs and yes. uh, therefore if we really want to communicate with somebody we need to use language that everybody understands and this goes back to your point when you were talking about working in sales how you have to make it relevant to your audience because you need them to listen and the best way for to do that is to talk their language, not your language. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you need to, if possible, um, you know, g- give them the the you know if you if 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 you've got a group of st- uh, stakeholders who are salesmen, you know, give them kind of used to seeing, but having that presenting the the, the project management information, so that they feel completely comfortable with the way that things are are being reported to them. Right, the last one is obtain and respond to feedback from stakeholders, which may have an impact on a project. So I suppose what kind of feedback do you get? We've already talked about putting out surveys and asking people. I suppose what what does that, this is talking about more general feedback on the actual project, not just on your communication methods. Um, Yeah. This is quite a sort of basic point, really, isn't it? That you need to be listening and you need to be taking on board what people are saying. Um, that doesn't mean always implementing whatever it is that somebody suggests, but it does mean you know not being in your position as a project manager that you're not open to to change. And I think again, you know, Agile has done a lot to push forward the idea that that we need to be more receptive to, to changes. Project managers should worry about changes they should embrace them and accept that that's what's going to happen not sort of curl up in a ball and scream out you know it's that's 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 the sort of old ways of working i think and it comes back to that iterative um if you've got iterative something that's iterative that means it's sort of it's a cycle you do something and you listen to the feedback and in order to improve you do have to listen to feedback basically that's right. And you have all the old cliches, you know, you have to not mind failing and to be open about the mistakes that you make and that your team make and everything else. So it does require potentially a change culture, mm-hmm. much more open way of dealing with, with, with people. But I think it's a, a lot more effective. I think this is probably quite an interesting one um, for people to write about in their applications because um, they say to use the is it the star format, the uh, situation, task, action and results that I bet everyone's had a time when they've done something and somebody's come back and gone, oh, don't like that, or, oh, I love that, you should implement it wider. Um, and that seems quite an easy one probably to demonstrate. Um, okay, so that's come to the end of the stakeholders and communications management and the end of the podcast. Um, thank you so much for your time. Oh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for asking me, Sol. I appreciate it. It's been lots of fun. <laughs> been listening to Sorrel's PM Times. If you want to find out more, look on our Twitter at times underscore PM, our website pmtimes.libson.com, join our Facebook group or add me on LinkedIn. Bye! Bye, 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 bye.